So I started working for the Secretary of the Interior in 1973. And in the course of less than five years, most of the environmental laws that underpin today's society were written. Clean Air, Clean Water, Dangerous Species Act, creation of CEQ and EPA, the Alaska Lands um, Conservation Package, and they all passed Congress. In these years, the leadership throughout the Nixon Ford administration was composed of progressive Republicans, most of whom were hunters. Rogers Morton, Russell Train, Bill Ruckelshaus, Nathaniel Reed, Roy Hughes, Jack Horton. They were a cast of characters, the likes of whom we haven't seen since. None of these individuals were ever stained with any self-dealing or any negative behavior. Ruckelshaus actually did a second stint at EPA under the Reagan administration. In those days, passage of environmental initiatives was largely bipartisan and propelled by the nightly loon stories, like the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland on fire, or Santa Barbara oil spills, which ignited broad public support for the passage of environmental laws that today remain our basic conservation infrastructure. In the, those yesteryears of the 1970s, large corporations mostly opposed or reluctantly stood by environmental initiatives. Driving in yesterday from DFW, I remember my uncle, Bobby Stewart, who was president of First National Bank, in the 1970s dismissing me as a communist knockoff. <laughs> if he was only alive today to witness the e-crowd of Greta millennials and the Green New Deal, I would have loved to see his face. The nonprofit world in those days was dominated by the big three, the Sierra Club, National Wildlife Federation, National Audubon, and a second string of EDF, NRDC, the Wilderness Society. TNC was just gaining national traction, boosted by Interior's bicentennial outreach to corporate leaders, which actually I was in charge of, um, and uh, like Waco, Union Camp. DU got a huge boost later from the passage of NACA, which I also was involved in, in the 80s. And by the mid-80s, there was a noticeable evolution taking place. T.R. Reid, who at the time was a Washington Post correspondent, put his finger on the pulse in a Sunday cover story. And I'm quoting, public interest lobbyists, and he was referring to the environmental movement, by becoming commonplace, have lost their cachet. Today, no matter how noble the organization they represent, they're just lobbyists. And at the time, the environmental movement started sliding into being an aggressive arm of the Democratic Party, lock, stock, and barrel. The big three NGOs all diversified their core market focus to their own detriment. For example, I was at National Audubon from 1980 to 1986 when Russ Peterson embarked on initiatives for agriculture, population control, anti-nukes, birth control, and public lands. And his successor, Peter Burley, tried to change Audubon's logo from a white egret to a black flag and almost destroyed the brand of Audubon for nature and bird conservancy. The Sierra Club fired its executive director, Doug Wheeler, because of his stellar Republican administration credentials and began their long march to being an exclusive Democratic standard bearer. Even National Wildlife Federation began a long slide into multi-decade marginality. TNC and Ducks Unlimited grew and expanded nationwide, and the rest of the environmental movement splintered and proliferate, proliferated into a niche market-based um, market based on game species. I mean, you name an animal and you got a, an organization today, quail, turkey, elk, mule deal, rough grouse, or geography, Yellowstone Coalition, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Everglades Foundation. Meanwhile, corporate America grabbed the, America, the environmental bit in its teeth. It started as a slow trot, then soon became a gallop to implement new technologies for cleaning clean air, water recycling, carbon reduction, and a swath of innovative products that continue to thrive 
and flourish expansively today. The forest products industry, nudged by Wall Street, completely disemboweled itself, selling off forest lands, which today have become REITs and privately owned companies. Simultaneously, we are witnessing the flocking of people to cities and suburbs, creating our current dominant metropolitan society that's gradually become both physically and intellectually divorced from rural America and now lives in a cocoon of self-delusion that's antagonistic to rural America and is also imbued with a hysteria of anti-hunting and climate activism. Throughout the 80s and 90s and the post-millennial decades, the numbers of hunters and fishers in the United States began an inexorable decline, mirroring our consolidation and increasing demographics of our metropolitan society. Millennials today, by and large, do not hunt and fish. They roll aboard. They do outdoor off-road biking, an array of outdoor activities that didn't even exist 50 years ago and as such as parading against free speech on every college campus in America. Meanwhile, state fish and game agencies, which were the powerhouses in Washington in the 1970s and 80s, have declined in effectiveness. Nationwide, four-fifths of the states have rolled over their state directors in just the last three years. AFWA, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies in Washington today, is a shadow of its former effectiveness in the 80s under Max Peterson. Last year, WAFWA, the Western Association, walked away from the range-wide plan for lesser prairie chicken after a $65 million investment from the oil and gas and associated industries. And new organizations like the Teddy Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, founded by my former board chair from National Fish and Wildlife, Jim Range, are beginning to fill this void. So, on the positive side of the ledger, the last two decades have brought forth three very positive developments that should be a focus for EarthX and a platform for moving EarthX forward. First, conservation easement law was expanded substantially under Senate leadership, Senator Grassley of Iowa was the lead, during the Bush 42 administration, providing substantial tax savings for farmers, ranchers, and forest owners, and was signed into law by President Bush in 2006 in the Pension Act, and finally made permanent in 2015. And that brings conservation potential to the entire ranch and agricultural sector. Second, cattlemen and ag land trusts created in the last two decades, starting with California, Colorado, and Texas, and I wrote the first checks for all three, um, now exist in Kansas, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. They marry conservation and wildlife conservation on private lands to working landscapes for the first time. Colorado and Texas land trusts, ag land trusts, are the largest in their respective states today. Texas Parks and Wildlife created a private lands program that was launched with NIFWF grants that I gave in 1993. They now have 33 million acres enrolled in Texas, 20% of the state, leading the nation in private land management. Third, and a particular resonance for, resonance for Safari Club members here, South African countries have pioneered, and I learned many of my personal tenants in Africa on their knees, they've pioneered the restoration and expansion of wildlife on private lands, providing a blueprint for broad replication in the United States on a scalable basis. You all should read this new book. It's coming out in March at the North American by Lowell Bear, Saving Species on Private Lands. It's basically a compilation of everything I've been preaching for 20 years, and it's, it's not going to um, be a thriller, but it's a really well-done book. Fourth, Incipient carbon markets for ranching and forests, represented by Indigo, ECMC, Debbie here, um, an offshoot of the Noble Foundation, the Muir Blackstone Initiative at Rice Institute, offer a huge opportunity providing new financing for ranchers as well as improving water retention 
So where do we go from here, and why is EarthX uniquely positioned as a platform for opportunity? First, let me state an underlying, but to me obvious, proposition. With the inexorable decline of hunt and fishing participants and corresponding loss of influence in Washington, and the dominance of Democratic constituents, urban constituents on the West Coast states, California, Washington, Oregon, the Mid-Atlantic, New England, and Illinois, it's absolutely imperative for hunting and fishing groups to link up and partner and collaborate formally with ranch, agriculture, and forest organizations across flyover America. We need these combined forces to work in harness to create a potent constituency for rural American resurgence and resurrection of the TR heritage for hunting, fishing, conservation, and privately driven wildlife conservation. And I think there are at least three specific opportunities to grasp and run with. First, Interior Secretary Bernhardt is going to key note EarthX on Saturday night, the 25th of April. Every one of the major national uh, press outlets, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, characterizes Bernhardt as a former oil and gas and water lobbyist. Two days ago, the lead story in High Country News, which I read on the plane down, and I'm quoting, David Bernhardt, the man in charge of our nation's public lands has come through the revolving door in Washington, D.C. and back out again. What they don't tell you is David grew up in the West, Rifle, Colorado, hunting and fishing, and more importantly, spent eight years in the Bush administration as Interior's Director of Congressional Affairs and Solicitor. As our new secretary, he has more experience managing the Department of Interior's programs than any prede excuse me, my beer, predecessor since Ro Franklin Roosevelt's Harold Ickes. And since we're in Texas, let me quote LBJ, who once umpined to a freshman senator. Um, Son, there are two kinds of horses. They're show horses and they're work horses. And boy, you got to decide in the U.S. Senate whether you're going to be a show horse or a work horse. My main senator, Susan Collins, is today's premier work horse in the Senate. And David Bernhardt is the best work horse in Interior's secretarial history. For the past four years, all his predecessors were show horses. Everyone here should support Bernhardt's keynote and bring at EarthX and bring five or ten additional people as guests. Second, for a decade, the environmental community has been infatuated with reauthorization, reauthorization of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which was recently accomplished. And now a second stage minuet is ongoing to make funding permanent and not subject to annual appropriations. This, in my mind, we don't need. And a far more important legislative initiative is the Restore America's Wildlife Act, spearheaded by John L. Morris of Bass Pro, one of my former board members. This legislation will provide a OCS funding, $1.3 billion, to fund state fish and game agencies whose core revenue based on aforementioned hunt and fish license fees are declining at the very time when their responsibility for non-game and endangered species are expanding exponentially. Support of this legislative initiative, which is also strongly supported by Colin Amara of the National Wildlife Federation, should be a core priority for EarthX. Third, EarthX is uniquely positioned to market and promote the following issues going forward. The linkage of hunt and fish organizations with the farm, ranch, forest, ag sector. 
NCBA, that's National Cattlemen's Beef Association, Farm Bureau, Cattlemen's Associations, Ag Land Trust, Community Con Collaborative Collaboration Conservation Initiatives as, as being initiated at Colorado State University. And being here in Dallas and functioning as the embodiment of Texas culture and entrepreneurship, EarthX offers both the opportunity and the nexus between industry and corporate leaders to collaborate, collaborate to address and solve environmental problems. The environmental world today is riven with partisan divides and virtually every issue from climate to wildlife. Texas has more private land than any state in the nation. It hosts the most robust private land conservation programs in the country at Texas Parks and Wildlife under Executive Director Carter Smith, who is by far the best in the business, and his predecessor Andy Sanson. And yet Texas also faces the most extreme development pressures in the nation. So those are three focus points. I'll close with a um, true story. So in inclusion, I'm reminded of Bill Ruckelshaus's roast for Russell Train at his retirement in Washington, D.C. He described his wedding night. He was prancing around in his bathrobe trying to quote Shakespearean sonnets and his wife Jill interjected, Dear Bill, I'm not prone to listen. <laughs> so let's get on with it. Much of the environmental sector is prone in terms of collaboration and originality today, and we can make EarthX a national success. So thanks.